But let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 as we continue this series on the book of Ecclesiastes that was written by uh, King Solomon. And if you weren't here last week, you can watch it on YouTube. Uh, last week, basically chapters 1 and 2, the focus was, he basically says, I can't find any satisfaction in this world. Amen? You, can't, you, there's no, you see, you got to understand, Solomon, uh, the Bible says he was the wisest of all, and you know, God blessed him. In fact, he asked God to give him wisdom and an understanding heart to rule the people. And God said, because you asked that, I'm going to give you wealth also and riches and honor, long life. But then, how I many, like I said last week, he ended up marrying 700 women. He had 700 wives and 300, uh, not porcupines, concubines. <laughs> and, uh, and, and in his later years, his wives turned him away from following God. And he started making these idols from the gods that the wives, they came from other nations. So he were, he, and the Bible says he loved foreign women Oh, yes, I like the French, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, he liked foreign women, and he clung to them in love. Uh, and, and, and so, but, but if anybody had everything, it was King Solomon. He had all the, he had his dream home. He had uh, uh, musicians. He had, he had maids. He had everything that you could think for. He had all the women you could ever want. He had everything, and yet he says, you know, yet it's still all nonsense. It's still all meaningless, basically, without God. And so, and so Ecclesiastes teaches us, teaches us that it doesn't matter what you have. Life is meaningless. I remember when I first got born again. Before I got born again, I was in that mode. I was only, what, 19, 20? And I was already like, what? I'm going to grow up, you know, go, you know, go to school, go get a job, get married, have kids. And then I die? Is that all really is this to life? Even then, as a young lad, I was already thinking that way about what's the purpose and meaning of life? So in other words, even to me, I thought, that's not enough for me. Because I'm going to do all this stuff, and then I die, and then I, I'm forgotten, nobody cares, no whatever. And so why am I wasting my life doing this? And I think that's why Paul said in another scripture, well, if that's true, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead and there's no afterlife, then we might as well eat and marry and, you know, be, eat and marry, be drink and, and, and eat and, and be merry. Why? Because tomorrow we die and that's it. See, the world thinks this way, but that's not true. God created us in His image, and He has a purpose and a plan for our lives. So, listen, so what we can learn from chapter 1 and 2 of Ecclesiastes is that it doesn't matter. You're, if you're not happy, listen, the world teaches things that when you get that dream, dream house, you're going to be happy. When you get that dream car, you're going to be happy. When you get that dream job, you're going to be happy. When you get that relationship you've been wanting, then you're truly going to be happy. Listen, if you're not happy with Jesus right now, just with Jesus himself, you will never be fully satisfied. And that's why the theme of last week was, I can't get no satisfaction. That's the, the world's theme song. I can't get no satisfaction in this world. Without God, apart from God, you can't find true satisfaction. So now we move on to chapter 3 and chapter 4. And notice this one, I'm titling this one, God makes everything beautiful in its time. God makes everything beautiful in its time. And so let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Because if you're there, you're there already. I haven't got there yet. There we go. So Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And we're going to start reading in verse 1. And notice, this is what we sang about, right? Here it is. It's in the Bible. Notice, verse 1. To everything there is a what? A season. A time for what? Every purpose under heaven. So, he, you know, so what, what Solomon was doing was examining the world. In other words... He had everything, man. So he said, you know, I'm going to see what it's like in the world. I'm going to check everything out. I'm going to get into laughter. I'm going to get into drinking. I'm going to try everything. And you know what he said? He said, it's all vanity. It's all meaningless. Without God, there's no purpose. It's meaningless. And so, so but notice, he says, though, in verse 1, to everything there is a season. Amen? There is a season for everything. There are seasons in our lives for everything. Yeah, I look back in my life, and I see the seasons that God had me and you know what I'm saying the seasons uh, when I first was born again you know I attended a church in Glendale and uh, and that's you know that's where uh, um, my season started I was there for you know several years and so forth and uh, uh, before God you know told me to go to Bible school in in the late you know in the 89 90 around there then I went to Bible school so I had a season 
I'm going to Bible school, and then, and then uh, I, I, you know, that church had kind of closed down, went a different direction, and, and uh, I went to Bible school. But then after that, you know, God called us to be at In Him Outreach Church with Pastor David. We were at a season there. We were, Pastor Lucy and I, she was uh, children's director. I was a music, music uh, uh, minister. So we were there for a season, right? We were there for a season and so forth, and, and, and everything was great. You know, we were there in the, in the 90s all the way to about 2000 where the season started running out. I, I sensed something was coming. It was weird. I, I, I had no reason to leave. I had, you know, I, I, was, a, I was associate pastor. I was a music director being, you know, uh, paid. Not a lot of money, but I was being paid. <laughs> and there, you know, and I had no reason to leave, yet something like a season was coming. Uh, uh, entering a new season. I thought it was going to be itinerant ministry, but God spoke to me one day when, when I stepped out. See, here's how God leads. You've got to step out, then He'll lead you which way to go. If you don't step out, if your ship isn't moving, then He has, he, he, you know, the Spirit is like the rudder. He'll guide you as you move. You have to move, be moving, though. Why do you want to be guided if you stay home and you're not doing nothing? You have to move forward for him to guide you. So, so anyway, so he led, you know, he, he finally he spoke to me and said, no, I want you to, you know, pioneer a church here in El Mirage. And, and I said, El Mirage? I said, I want to, Lord, why me? <laughs> you know, El Mirage has a lot, had several small churches, and I don't want to start another church in El Mirage. And anyway, and then going back to your own hometown, you know what I'm saying? What, you know, they already know me. They, you know, they're, they're my, the ones that I used to throw rocks at, they might remember me <laughs> when I was a kid. You know what I'm saying? The high school students, you know, they know me. They don't want to, they're not going to come, you know? And that's true. A lot, of, a lot of them don't come, you know what I'm saying? Because there's just familiarity. How can God use that whip, young whippersnapper? Who, do, who does he think he is? Right? So, and so, and it was a season. It's, and God has us in times and seasons and so forth. And, and uh, 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 you know, we all have a purpose and a time for a season. So, so sometimes when things come to an end in your life, don't feel like it's the end. No. Feel like it's a new opportunity for what God has. You got to be open. Things have to die sometimes before something else opens up. Right? Things do have to die sometimes and before another opportunity will open. It's like the doors get shut and then God opens other doors. But let's read it. Look at this. A time for every purpose under heaven. Um, Let's read uh, verse 2. A time to be born. I don't want to sing it because we just sang it. A time to be born. A time to die. A time to plant. A time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill. A time to heal. Notice. There's a time to kill some things. I'm, I'm not talking about murder here. Right? Kill some things in your life. Right? A time to heal. A time to break down. There's some things in your life that you just need to get rid of. Amen? Amen? He's not talking about break down. Let's break it down. That's not what he's talking about, right? Break it down. And a time to build up. There's a time to build things up. Listen, a time to weep. Is there a time to weep? Yeah. This is part of life. And a time to laugh, though. There's also a time to laugh. And notice, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. I, I was studying this and I was reading that like enemies, what they would do when somebody would come to a land... They would throw stones all over their land so they wouldn't farm it. That's what the enemy would do. <laughs> so a time to gather stones so, what, so you can start planting, right? And so a time to embrace and a time to refrain. Notice there's a time to, to embrace someone, but there's a time. How many know when you're correcting your kids or whatever? There's, there's correction. You know, no, no, there's no embrace right now. You better go take care of that. <laughs> right? So there's a time to embrace. There's a time to refrain from embracing, right? Uh, uh, a time to gain and a time to lose weight. Is that what I said? No, no, I just said That's my translation. A time to gain weight and a time to lose weight. So I'm an equal opportunity. Equal opportunity, either gain it or lose it, right? There's a time to gain it during Christmas and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. Ladies, talking to you about your closets. There's some things you need to keep, and there's some things you need to throw away, right? <laughs> men, say, men say amen. Amen? How long are you going to keep them shoes? <laughs> no, Pastor, they're good shoes. Can't throw them away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. Sometimes, you know, you just need to be quiet and just let things work out. 
Other times you really need to speak up. But see, that's being led by the Spirit. Amen. And so notice, uh, um, a time to love and a time to hate. Now, not, not hate people, not hate, you know what I'm saying? But hate maybe what they're doing. Maybe the situation they're in and so forth. Show them, I love you, but what you're doing, I can't approve of that. Come on now. A time of war and a time of peace. And this is talking about the, at the house. <laughs> sometimes there's a time of war and sometimes there's a time of peace. Right? <laughs> sometimes you have to throw the surrender flag. Right? <laughs> oh my or oh me. Now here's the thing though. When we, when we look at all these things in life, notice some are negative, some are positive. But that's part of this life that we live in, right? That's part of this life that we, life, that we live in. The key to what, the where, and when, and how is learning to be led by His Spirit. See, when we study this in the Old Testament, the Ecclesiastes, we got to study it with what? With a New Testament mentality. So, so even though this is what he was saying, yet, when do you do all these things? You, that's where, as a believer, you have to be led by a spirit. Look at Romans 8.14. What does Romans 8.14 says? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are what? Sons of God. Amen? Many, in fact, one translation says those that are mature, sons of God, are led by the Spirit of God. Because how many know a Christian that's not mature, they're led by their flesh. They're led by their emotions. And to be honest with you, you know why we have problems? Do you, know, you want to know, you know the only problem we have is, you know what it is? Moi, me, you. Amen? You're the problem. In other words, if we have problems, it's because of us. Amen? If we, why? Because either we're walking in the flesh, or we're being led by the Spirit. If you're being led by the Spirit then guess what? You will what? Follow and be led. God will lead you what to do. He'll give you the perfect timing and guide you and so forth. If you're led by your flesh or by your emotions, and listen, I'm not, I'm not judging anybody because I'm, I'm, we're all there. We all have to, it, it's a constant battle to be led by the Spirit and not by your flesh. Amen? And by your emotions. Because your emotions will go whack, right? Your flesh and, 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 and it's the Word of God, though, that can control them through the Word of God. So, we're to be led by the Spirit. In fact, Galatians 5.25, if you have that, Galatians 5.25 in the TPT says, We must live in the Holy Spirit and what? Follow after Him. Amen? If we live in the Spirit, we need to follow after Him. See, we live in the Holy Spirit already. In fact, in fact Romans 8.9, I don't know if you have that one, Romans chapter 8, verse 9, notice... Did you know that you, you're not, God doesn't see you in the flesh anymore? Now think about it. When Pastor Lucy was up here exhorting you about, hey guys, no matter if you've sinned or whatever, you can still worship God. Why was she doing that? How does she have the legal right to say that? Because God does not see you in the flesh anymore. He sees you in the spirit. God doesn't look at you through your sins. God doesn't look at you through your failures. God doesn't look, look you know what I'm saying? God doesn't, uh, 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 He doesn't see you that way. If you truly believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, God sees you in the Spirit. Can I prove it to you? Look at the Scripture. Verse 9. If you, but you are not in the flesh. Because the previous verse I said, hey, don't be fleshly minded. Don't be carnally minded. Quit, quit being carnally minded. Why? He says, you're not in the flesh. But you're what? You're in the Spirit. See, that's the way God sees you. So that's why when Pastor was Lucy, Lucy was saying you can come up and worship God if you've sinned or whatever. Why? Because, why? God doesn't see you in your flesh. In your flesh, you have, you're, you're falling short of the glory of God. All of us still fall short of the glory of God in our flesh. But God doesn't see you in the flesh. He sees you in the Spirit. Who you are in Christ in the Spirit. Why? If He didn't, then He would keep a record of all our wrongs. So, notice, you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So, notice, God, you can, you can walk in the Spirit. Why? Because you're already in the Spirit. So, if you're in the Spirit, then walk according to who you are. In other words, walk according to who you are in the Spirit, not according to what? How you feel, not according to your mistakes, not according to your mess-ups, and so forth. Be led by His Spirit, by who you are on the inside, instead of how you feel on the outside. So we live in the Spirit, so let us what? Walk in the Spirit, just like the children. In fact, here's a great example. Remember the children of Israel? When God told them to build that tabernacle in the wilderness? 
He had them build that tabernacle in the wilderness. And, and here's, you know, how, you know what God did in the day? He, it was a pillar of cloud to bring shade in the desert during the day. You know, because they've been through the desert on a horse with no name. They're walking through the desert. And God would be like a pillar of cloud during the day. And then at nighttime, you know what that pillar of cloud turned into? A night light. It was a pillar of fire. And it would keep him warm in the cold desert at night and keep him cool in the hot desert during the day. So what, what was that cloud? It was the Shekinah glory of God. It was the presence of God. So God, listen, this is so exciting. God, God loved us so much that even after Adam and Eve sinned and they were walking and talking with God, God had to find a way to get back to us. So during the Old Testament, he has them build a temple. And when they built a temple, which is a picture of Jesus, the temple skins that was over it was badger skins. Why? To show that on the outside, when Jesus shows up, he'll look like any normal human being, but on the inside is the glory of God. And so, and so it was a picture of Jesus Christ. That temple was a picture. And, and, and the camp was laid out in a cross. And so there's the tabernacle. This represents Jesus, right? And the glory of God is there. So God says, I want to what? Walk among my people. I want to, they have sinned. Now, of course, they had sinned, they've fallen short. But God found a way through Adam's fall in the Old Testament to what? Walk among the people. He wanted to live among them. But they couldn't just approach him anyway. The only way they could approach him is through a sacrifice of a lamb or an animal. Why? A picture of Jesus. The only way you can approach God's presence is through what Jesus would do in his death, burial, and resurrection. So God was already painting a picture. The only way you're going to reach me is through the death and burial and resurrection of my son. So that was all a picture of Jesus. All the sacrifices, the burn offer, that's all a picture of Jesus. The laver was the washing of the water of the word. The altar was the cross. The, 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 the candelabra was a picture of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The, the bread was a picture of the word of God. Jesus is the manna, the living word. And so, and so you can only, so God wanted to live what? Amongst us, amongst us. But he wasn't satisfied with that. So later on, here he comes, God himself in the flesh. God became a man and he what? Dwelt among us before he was in this glory cloud, but now he, he chose to live among us in the person of Jesus Christ. And so God became a man and he says, it's not enough that I'm in the glory cloud. I don't want to just be in their midst. I want to live among them, you know, being able to touch them, being able to feel man. And he did for 33 years. But God said, that's still not good enough. Jesus said, it's beneficial that I go away. Why? Because if I go away, my spirit or the spirit of Christ will come. And now he's going to live on the inside of you. So glory to God. God not, wasn't satisfied living uh, among us in a glory cloud. He wasn't satisfied living uh, uh, among us as a human being. Now he lives on the inside of you. That's how much now he has a relationship with you. So, so why would God curse you? Why would God put you down if he's living on the inside of you? Amen. Right? So I said all of that, and that must have been the Holy Spirit, because I said all that for this purpose. When the glory of cloud lifted, the people packed their tents, and they followed wherever the glory cloud went. As soon as the glory cloud set down somewhere, then they put the tabernacle back up, they put their tents, and they camped. So that's being led by the Spirit. They never moved unless God's Spirit lifted and moved to another place. Then he would settle somewhere, and they would camp right there. Okay, glory cloud's not moving anymore. That's where we camp. There, that's a beautiful picture in the Old Testament of being led by the Spirit. The grace of God will be there to do what God tells you to do. But if that grace ever lifts, amen, then you what? You follow where it leads to. And you go there. But in the same time, God in normal decisions in life, when you're asking God, should I buy a car or whatever? You'll, you'll have peace there. You, peace will always be within you. But if you're, you're looking to buy this vehicle and all of a sudden the peace lifts, hello, God is speaking to you. God is leading you by a spirit that you need to move. In other words, don't, don't get this. Amen? A pastor, it's a great investment. They, I can make a lot of money, whatever. Well, sounds great, but do you feel peace there? It, or has the peace lifted? If it's lifted, you better not go. You're going to be, it, it's going to be a mess. 
right? And so, and so do you see that? It, it's a lead, God leads by His Spirit. And that's how we're led today as far as the what, the where, the when. Amen? Now let's move on because verse 9. Now here, this section here from verse 9 through 13, I want to talk about that God makes everything beautiful in its time. What profit has the worker from that which he labors? If I have, I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. Verse 11. He has made everything what? Beautiful in his time. He has made, I want you to put that in the NLT and the Amplified. Notice, God makes what? Everything beautiful, verse 11, in what? In his time. In his time. So God does have a plan. God does have a plan and a purpose for your life. Amen? Do you have it? Notice NLT. Yeah, God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. See, we're different from other creatures. God put what eternity, that means we're a spiritual being in our hearts. See, like me when I was wondering, what's purpose for life? Just grow up, die, and that's it? There's got to be a reason. Amen? There's got to be more reasons. Uh, amen? And so he planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. See, God won't reveal the whole plan to you right away. You would probably freak out. If God were to reveal His whole plan for your life, like from the beginning, you know what I'm saying? You would probably not even start walking in that direction. Amen? Amen? That's how God's led me. Amen? And that's how I, I, God showed me some things in the beginning, but He's led me, you know, in certain directions and so forth. So notice though, God is going to, God will make, no matter what you're going through right now, God will eventually make everything beautiful in its time. You got the Amplified too? Look at the Amplified. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He also has planted eternity in man's hearts and minds. A divinely implanted sense of a what? Purpose. Working through the ages, which nothing under the sun, but God alone can what? Satisfy. See, only God can satisfy you and give you your purpose. Yet, so that men cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Now, let's, let's move on. Look at verse 12. Verse 12, I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. So what is he saying? So in other words, if you believe that God has a plan and a purpose for your life, when you're on that journey, you need to what? You rejoice in what God has blessed you with in your life. And always what? Aim to do the right thing at all times. Live the good life, in other words, in the Lord. Amen? Rejoice in the things that God has given you. Amen? Rejoice in what He's given you and, and, and try to always, what? Do the right thing. Amen. Amen? Always do the right thing. Right? And let's go on. Look at the next verse. Oh, oh, oh let, me say, let me mention this. I forgot to mention this. Psalm 139, 16. When it talks about God making beautiful in its time, I want you to see this verse. This is amazing. I want you to go to Psalm 139, verse uh, 16. I'm gonna, we're going to see it in the NLT, TBT, and the message. Listen. You saw me before I was born. Look at that. God has a plan for your life. God saw you before you ever were created. Every day of my life was what? Recorded in your book. What? So you got to understand, God is not limited by time. God is not controlled by time. God, see, God could put the whole universe in the box. And he could step in there in time, but he can also step out. So he sees everything, the past, the present, and the future. So when God says something's going to happen in the future, guaranteed it's going to happen. So guess what? Even in your life, God already had a plan for your life. Are you following that plan? Or are you doing your own will? Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Let's put it in the other translation if you can for me. TBT, you saw who you created me to be before I became me. <laughs> Hello? God saw you before you were created, people. I don't know if that blows, doesn't blow you away. It blows me away. Right? That means I'm not an accident. Yeah, but I was born out of wedlock. It, you're not an accident. God allowed you to be born. You were born. God could have stopped it, but he wanted you to be born. Before I'd ever seen the light of day, the number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. Wow. 
Next one, you show, show the other message. Oh yes, you shape me first inside and out. You form me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God. Your breathtaking body and soul, I am marvelously made. I worship in adoration to what a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made bit by bit, how well it was sculpted from nothing into something like an open book. You watch me grow from conception to birth. Do you see why I don't agree with abortion according to the Bible? Because God is watching that baby grow from conception to birth. So why are we killing what God is watching? All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I'd even live one day. Like that, like that famous uh, TV series. Welcome to the days of our lives. Nah. <laughs> right? God had all those days for your lives prepared. Yes. Amen? Yes. Welcome to As the Stomach Turns. <laughs> as the Stomach Turns is what it should be called. Anyway, but uh, let's go on. Look at this. So let's go on to verse 13 though. Are you seeing that? God had a plan and a purpose for your life. Verse 13. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is what? The gift of God. Did you know? That the fact that if you can eat, enjoy it. If you can drink, enjoy it. If, you see what I'm saying? If you can work, enjoy it. Did you know that's all a gift from God? Amen. So don't take what you have for granted. Enjoy what God's blessed you with. It's a gift. How many would wish they could have arms or legs that don't have them? Or have certain things that you don't have? Or could speak that can't speak? It's a gift from God. Everything you have. And you might say, but Pastor, I'm, you know, I have some issues physically, whatever. Well, can you talk? Can you, can you speak? Can you, can you smile? Amen. Those are all gifts from God. Amen. All, everything is a gift from God. Amen? So if you can work and enjoy it, thank God. Thank God that you can work even if you don't like your job. Amen. Believe Him for a better one if you don't like it. He will gift you with a better one. Come on, let's keep reading. Now, so now... Let's talk about injustices that we see in here. Injustice may seem to prevail, but God will still judge. Here, so he starts looking at the injustices that are happening in the world. Let's read from Ecclesiastes 3.14. Look at this. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing can be taken from it. God does it that men should fear before Him. Amen. In other words, God keeps His word so that people will worship God. And we'll, we'll respect God for who He is. Verse 15. That which is, has already been and that which is to be has already been. You see, in God's time, because why? He sees the past, He sees the present, He sees the future. And God requires an account of what is past. Verse 16. Moreover, I saw under the sun, in the place of judgment, wickedness was there. And in the place of righteousness, inequity was there. And I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time... Uh, there for every purpose and for every work. Now, I want you to read, can you put that in the message, verse 14 and 15? I mean, no, when you look at life, there's things that you look at and it seems like it's not fair. Look at this. I've also concluded that whatever God does, that's the way it is going to be always. No addition, no subtraction. God's done it and that's it. That's so we'll quit asking questions and simply worship in holy fear. Right? God wants us to what? Take him at his word. Now, now, can you put uh, uh, verse 16 and 17 in the NLT? Verse 16 and 17 in the NLT. I've also noticed that under the sun, there's an evil in the courtroom. Yes, even the courts of law are corrupt. Even Solomon admitted. It's not per in this world, it's not perfect. Right? We're, we're, right? Let's keep reading. I said to myself, in due season... Though God will judge everyone, both good and bad, for all their deeds. The good news for us believers is that God will not judge us for our sins because God already judged His Son on the cross for our sins. Amen. Now, if we do bad things as a Christian and, or do something, what those things will be burned up. We will not get any reward for anything we do, even if it seems to be a good thing, but our intentions are not right. Anything that's not done out of love, you lose 
But if you do it out of love for somebody, out of, because of God's love in you, you will receive a reward for that. Amen? But thank God that God's not going to judge us for our sins. Because who would stand then? Right? Jesus, that's what Jesus came to do, to pay for that. Now let's keep reading. Look at this. Verse 18. I said in my heart concerning the condition of the sons of men, God tests them that they may see that they themselves are like animals. Verse 19. For what happens to the sons of men also happens to animals. One thing befalls them. As one dies, so, one di so dies the other. Surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage over animals for all is vanity. You've got to understand, when Solomon is writing this, he doesn't have the knowledge we have today that we're not animals. That we do have an afterlife. That we're, we have a spirit, you know, within us and so forth. And, and so forth. Let's keep reading. Notice. Verse 20. All go to one place. All are from the dust. And all return to dust. Now our body, yes, physical dust. Who knows the spirit of the sons of men, which goes what? Upward. And the spirit of the animal, which goes down to the earth. So I perceive that nothing is better than that a man should rejoice in his own works. For that is his heritage. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? Now again, King Solomon, he couldn't prove where a person's spirit goes when they die. But today we can. Why? Because 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 through 8 says, To be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. See, he didn't have that knowledge that we have today. So he was speaking with the revelation knowledge that he had. That's why when we study the Old Testament, we always study with a New Testament mentality. Amen? And, and so forth. And then notice in verse 22, it says, talks about enjoying. We, sh we should enjoy the here and the now. Amen? He, he says he didn't know the future, but we do. Now here he says he didn't know what's going to happen in the future. We know what's, we have an afterlife. We know what's going to happen in our future. Amen? Amen? We know what God has planned for us. So, but he didn't. We know John 14 says, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back to receive you to myself. So we know Jesus is coming to get us out of this place. What I like about Ecclesiastes, it just shows us this world is not for us. This world will never satisfy us. You know what we're doing? We're pilgrims. We're just journeying through this earth. It's like we're camping. How many know? I like camping, but not for, you know, five weeks, six weeks or a year. Camping will get old after that long, right? It's, so the same thing. You know what? This is our tents right here. This is our tents. These bodies are our tents. We're camping. We're, this is, you know, it's temporary. We're, how many know? Just like that camping tent gets older, our bodies are getting older and eventually it's going to what? Wipe out and it's going to be worn, worn out. Amen? Amen? The, the windows, you know, the windows in your tent, if you have one of the has those, it's getting dimmer. Amen? Some of you, that's why you need glasses. Amen? Because your windows are getting a little dimmer and so forth. Uh, uh, come on now. Amen? There's some cracks that are happening around here and so like that. You know what I'm talking Some wrinkles. Amen? And, and, and how many know, isn't it something? It's vanity. People in the world, come on. All these, uh, don't get me on it, Lord, don't get me on All these people that are focusing on, on, on you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, you know what I'm saying? To try to make, keep themselves young, it ain't going to last. Amen? It ain't going to last. Because why? We're all going to eventually get older. Now listen, if the barn needs painting, go ahead and paint the barn. That's okay. Amen? You know what I'm saying? What? <laughs> if the barn needs pain, go ahead. It's okay to, to put cosmetics on. It's okay to do, make yourself look good. Amen. There's, there's nothing wrong with that or whatever. But don't take it to extreme. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Don't take it to extreme. So you come out and you're like, <laughs> we don't recognize you anymore. Amen. They might not be able to recognize you if, you know. <laughs> Kiss me. Are you going to kiss me or eat me? <laughs> Pastor, that's not nice. Just keep looking forward. Hey, look, I dyed my hair for years, so I'm, I'm, I'm vain too. Oh, you're so vain. You probably just think the song is about you. Yes, I, I dyed my hair for years. I finally stopped doing it. And look at what happened to me now. I told Brother Cecil, I think I'm going to color it black again so I can look young. That's my flesh. See, my flesh wants to do that. Huh? 
Look at Cecil. He's got black hair on top, but he's got gray hair on his beard. He must color it. No, he doesn't. Grecian formula. Right? And so, you see what I'm saying? People, I guess the bottom line is this. Don't put all your marbles in this world because it's not... Yeah, sin is pleasurable for a season, but it just doesn't last. Because then I want another chocolate bar, and then I want another chocolate bar, and I want another... How many can I eat? Amen? My car, when I bought my truck, it was nice, but it was new. But then it got messed up, and I was like, for whatever. Amen? So, so let's go on, though. Look at the next one. Here's another, another thing we can learn here, and this is a good one. Overworking for selfish reasons won't bring satisfaction. Let's look at it. Look at let, let, well. Let's keep let's keep reading from chapter four, though, and we'll go get into it. Then I returned and considered all the oppression that is done under the sun, and look, the tears of the oppressed, but they have no comforter. On the side of their oppressors there is power, but they have no comforter. Verse two. Therefore I praise the dead who are already dead more than the living who are still. <laughs> He's kind of cynical here, isn't he? <laughs> Yet better than both is he who has, was, better is the person who never existed, he says, <laughs> who, who has not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Again, it, it kind of puts the, you know, that in the world without God, it's meaningless. It's vanity. It's just, you know, get up, go to work, get up, go to work, get up, go to work, go to sleep, get up, go to work. It's meaningless. Life is meaningless without God. There's got to be more to it than that. And there is. You can have a relationship with Jesus Christ and, and, and He has a plan for your life. Amen? So let's look, go to, look at verse 4. Again, I, I said that for all toil and every skillful work, a man is envied by his neighbor. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. Look, can you put that in the NLT and the CEV? Notice, what does he mean? I observe that most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors. But this too is meaningless, the chasing the wind. Put the other one. Then I realize that we work and do wonderful things just because we are jealous of others. Anybody here jealous of others? Don't raise your hands. He's saying, you know why we're working? In other words, you know, let me put it this way. Keeping up with the Joneses. I got to have more money to keep up with the Joneses. He says, he said, Solomon, I am, I'm observing the people, they're putting all, oh, they're overworking to make money. So what does that happen? It, it means that you're loving money more than, come on now. You can have a love for money. And a love, money is not evil, but a love for money is the root of all kinds of evil. So don't overwork for something that what, can take wings and fly away? Right? So people work hard and are motivated to sex because they, why? Because of envy. They, and they, they want to keep up with, they got the latest thing, I want to, I want to be able to get that. Let's keep reading, verse 5. Verse 5. The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. Now you're going to like this one. <laughs> basically, uh, in fact, basically he's saying that lazy people don't want to work. Are we seeing that today? A lot of lazy people don't want to go back to work. There's employees that have job openings and nobody wants to work. Come on now. Easy, the easy translation says, fools refuse to work. They die because they have no food. <laughs> it leads to their destruction. Amen? In fact, Paul was pretty bold in the New Testament. He says, if you don't work, you don't eat. You need to teach that to your kids. Learn to work because if you don't work, you're not going to eat. Amen? Well, I'm glad I showed up today. <laughs> Verse 6. Better a handful with quietness than both hands full together with toil and grasping for the wind. Can you put that in the CV? Notice it. They're very interesting. Yet, he says, does that mean... Okay, see, there's got to be balance. You should work and work hard, but don't overdo it also. Yet a little food eaten in peace is better than twice as much earned from overwork and chasing the wind. Amen. So in other words, it's better than other. So what's the point? Balance, man. 
Balance. You've got to be balanced in these things. It's good to work, but don't overdo it. To try to get more, 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 and, and you're, you're neglecting your family. You're neglecting your, your kids. You're neglecting, see what I'm saying? Your church. Right? And so don't do that. Let's keep reading. Uh, see, so there's some good things we can learn from, from Ecclesiastes. Verse 7, Then I returned, and I saw a, a vanity under the sun. He says, There is one alone without companion. Remember that song? One is the loneliest number that you ever knew. <laughs> Two can be as bad as one, but the loneliest number is the number one. The <laughs> That's the, What's the band? Three Dog Night. You know why they were called Three Dog Night? Did anybody know why they were called Three Dog Night? Because in Alaska, it gets so cold, it's so cold that you need three dogs to keep you warm. It's a three dog night. I know, Pastor, I really needed to know that. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I came to church to learn how three dog night got their band name. You see, you never know what you're going to learn at church. <laughs> so notice what he says in verse 8. <laughs> Listen, yet there is no end to all his labors nor his eye is satisfied with riches. Notice this, this loner here is not satisfied with his riches. But he never asks, for whom do I toil and deprive myself of good? This also is vanity and a grave misfortune. In other words, if you're alone, don't overwork to get rich. Who are you going to leave all the wealth to? And why work so hard for something you're not going to see? Now it's true today that you can sow it to others, you know, who are not your family, but there must be balance again. Now, switching gears, let's go on. We're almost done here, but next he talks about the value of a friend. Look at verse 9. Two are better than one. Goes with that song I just sung. Because they have what? A good reward for their labor. Amen? The reason that two are better than one is why? Because they can help each other out succeed. And that's one of the benefits, in fact, that's one of the benefits of marriage. Right? Because two are, can help, one can help the other in life and so forth. Amen? Two are better than one. But, uh, uh, again, that's one of the benefits of marriage. And look at verse 10. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has what? No one to help him up. So there's benefits, of course, in having a friend and having companions and, and, and being married and so forth and so on. All these things. There's benefits to it, what? To, to help the other when the other person falls. But that's one of the benefits of being in church and building friendships in church. Why? So you have friends that you can talk to when you're going through a tough time or you're falling in a certain area and you need help. That's the benefit of being hooked up with the body of Christ. Don't be alone. You should never be alone. That's why you should be in church and, and build friends, especially if you're by yourself. Amen? Build, build friendships in the body of Christ so you're not alone to help you. Amen? Verse 11. Again, if two lie down together, they will what? Keep warm. And no one, but how can one keep warm alone? Of course, of course, there's a benefit in marriage and whatever or a family where there's two that can keep warm if it's cold or whatever. There's benefits. Verse, verse 12. Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not what? Quickly broken. Amen? Not quickly broken. So two can protect each other better than one. And of course, let's say a family can protect each other even more. Can you put this in the message for me? This verse, uh, verse I think it's verse, verse 12 or the one in the message. Listen, by yourself, you're unprotected. With a friend, you can face the worst. See the benefits? of having developing friendships. Well, pastor, I don't have any friends. You know how to be you know how to have friends? Be friendly. <laughs> Become a friend, be friendly. Start talking to somebody, be friendly, you know, bless, you know, just be there. By yourself you're unprotected with a friend, you can face the worst. Amen. You and me against the world. Remember that song? <laughs> you and me against the world. With, with a friend you can face, can you round up a third? A, a three-stranded rope is, isn't easily, what? Snapped. Amen. Otherwise, by yourself, oh, oh, snap. 
Ay, 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 let's finish this up. Verse 13. This, I'm going to wrap it up with this. Popularity won't last. This is good for us to learn. Especially us young people. I said us young people. Verse 13. Amen? I'm a young senior. <laughs> Amen? I can move to Sun City West now, eh? I can move to Sun City, Sun City West, Sun City Grand. Verse 13. Listen. Consider the work <laughs> of God. For who can make straight what he has made crooked? Oh, I'm reading the wrong. Am I, I'm sorry, I went to the wrong. What happened to me? It's in the movie. Oh, here it is. <laughs> in the wrong. <laughs> what happened here? That was a, no, it was not a senior moment. That was not a senior moment. I bind that in Jesus' name. I got a sound mind, a great memory, sharp, calm, well balanced mind. 2020 vision. Good looking. All right. Here it is. I accidentally turned it. Verse 13. <laughs> it reminds me of Pastor David. One time he was at Rhema. Remember the story? Pastor David was at Rhema. And he was laughing at this young guy that was sleeping during the class. You know, he's like bobbing and everything. And, and he was laughing. Like, <laughs> and he was telling one of the guys, look at He's falling asleep and whatever. And you know what he said? He said he ended up falling asleep himself. <laughs> Pastor David, he fell asleep. And he said, and for making fun of that guy, he says, I fell asleep. <laughs> Verse 13. So listen, better a poor and wise youth than an old foolish king who will be admonished no more. For he comes out of prison to be king, although he was born poor in his kingdom. Verse 15, I saw all the living who walk under the sun. They were with the second youth who stands in his place. Verse 16, there was no end of all the people over whom he was made king. Yet those who come afterward will not rejoice in him. Surely this is also vanity and grasping for the wind. I want you to go to the, we're going to read it in the, in, the, in the message Bible. Because I think it's just more clear. I want you to see this. A poor youngster with some wisdom is better off than an old but foolish king who doesn't know which end is up. <laughs> I saw a youth I saw a youth just like this start with nothing and go from rags to riches. And I saw everyone rally to the rule of this young successor. See, when you're young, people and especially if you got money, oh man, you'll get a, you can you can have a lot of friends. People will rally around you. Amen. Amen. And, and, and so forth. You're young. You, you, you've got all these things. People will rally just like the Phoenix Suns. They're young. They're all rallying around them. Then they lost. Everybody takes off. Anyway. <laughs> but listen. And I saw everyone rally to the rule of this young successor to the king. Even so though, the excitement what? Died quickly. The throngs of people soon lost what? interests. Can't you see it's only smoke? What is he saying? Look, you may be the youngest one on the block right now and everybody's after you and whatever and every saying good things about you but guess what? Just wait a few more years and pretty soon you'll be a byword and they're like, you're not popular. What happened? I'm not popular anymore. That's why I'm amazed with young ministers and whatever. I mean, we're young. We, oh yeah, man, we're going to be all, all this and get, look, people will like you and say, pretty soon you're old and they're starting, get out of here. You're, we, get, we need somebody young in here. Popularity doesn't last. That's why in my vanity I want to color my hair so I stay young. Maybe silver and black. Oh yeah, that's right, I already have silver. There may be some black. <laughs> so, so, so what's the point? You can become popular in the world, but it never lasts. As soon as the next young leader rises up, people are going to go after him or her, and you'll be forgotten. Look at all the people in the world that have been popular, whether it's movies or, or music or whatever. Yeah. They're gone. Amen? They're gone. And, and popularity never lasts for us. All others will come and go, but only one who will always, the only one that's the most popular and will, through world history and for all time is, guess what? Our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, I looked this, I Googled this up. Uh, uh, even Time Magazine they did an article of who's the biggest, the 100 most significant figures of history. 
And the, guess what? Jesus is number one. Amen? Well, guess what? I am popular. What do you mean, Pastor? Because I'm in Christ. I'm in the popular one. Amen? I'm in the awesome one. I'm in the glorious one. I'm so... I, I, I'm, and listen, and the Bible says that when we see Him, we will be like Him because we're going to see Him as He is. Glory to God. Look at what God has planned for you. you. You might not be popular right now. People might not care for you right now. But guess what? When that day comes and the trumpet blows and those things you did when you were out there serving those children, when you were out there changing that diaper, guess what? The trophies are going to be meted out and guess what Pastor Manuel you get to the back over there you're just the face of the church let bring out the real workers over there over there all over there they're doing all that and they're going to come and you're going to have a bigger trophy and I'm going to be like how about me Lord <laughs> come on now see you got to have an eternal perspective and how God sees things it matters when you do what you do for the Lord. And Jesus said, if you give a cup of water in my name, you will be blessed. You will be rewarded. Amen? And guess what? Napoleon was number two. Martin Luther was 17. The Apostle Paul was 34. David, King David of Israel was 57. St. Peter was 65. And Elvis Presley was 69. Uh-huh. Hey, hey. I'm all shook up. 69. Amen. I didn't see my name in there. <laughs> 1 billion 235. <laughs> well, at least my wife thinks I'm popular. I'm popular to one. To one. <laughs> so, what do we learn? Number one, we learn that God will make everything in our lives beautiful in its time. So what should you do? You keep doing God's will for your life, no matter how it looks right now. Number two, injustice may seem to prevail, but God will judge in the end. So keep trusting God. If people's hurt you, people have done wrong things to you, keep trusting in God. He'll always do what is right. The Bible says vengeance is God's, not yours. He'll take care of your business. Three, Overworking for selfish reasons won't bring satisfaction. So what should you do? Focus on the Lord and your family too, and your church family too. Don't overwork to, you know, to be rich. Amen? Now, are we against riches? No. There's nothing wrong with having riches as long as riches don't have you. Also, we learned the value of having friends. So find yourself some good friends, especially in the body of Christ. And then finally, Popularity won't last. So quit trying to impress people. Right? Because the only one, guess what? God is already impressed with you. Why? Because, why? You were impressed with His Son. God finds pleasure in you and He loves you. He, God, God loves you so much. Just like you, listen, as a parent. When, when somebody is good to your child, when somebody says good things to your kids, what does that do to you as a parent? You're so, you know, oh, you like that person. But guess what? God loves you and finds pleasure in you when you what? Because you accepted his son, whom he loves very much. And he loves you as much as he loves his son. See, some people can't, some people don't believe that yet. Pastor, how could he love, God love me as much as he loves his son? Because he was willing to give him up to the cross. He was willing to give him up in your place. That's proof positive that he loves you as much as he loves his son. And now we are sons and daughters of the king. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. Oh, thank you for the things we've learned from this precious book of Ecclesiastes. Help us, Lord God. Help us in the name of Jesus to not put other things ahead of you, Lord. Help us to trust that you're going to make everything beautiful in your time as we look to you. And, and if people have wronged us, help us to forgive them and let it go and to trust you. Because you're a good judge and you'll judge justly. 
And help us, Lord, not to overwork, to be rich and to, to put uh, money or anything else first above you, Lord, but to trust you. And help us, Father, to find good friends that love you, Lord, that want to do your will. And help us, Lord, not to try to impress people. But, Lord, our only goal is to impress you, to love on you, to have a relationship with you. And we thank you, Father. We love you. Thank you for your word and all the things that are in your word. Now, I want to give an opportunity. If there's anyone that's watching or anyone here, you've not made Jesus your Savior, your Lord. Amen. I want to give you this opportunity. So let's just, just pray this prayer together if you'd like to receive Jesus. And let's say this together. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father thank, you for your word. thank you for your word. I recognize, I recognize that I don't have satisfaction in this world. This world doesn't satisfy. I realize I've sinned, that I'm a sinner. But I've heard your word, that Jesus died for my sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again. I choose to make Jesus my Lord and my Savior. Come into my life, Jesus. Change me now. Make me a new creation. And I receive your gift of forgiveness and your gift of righteousness and by faith from this day forward I proclaim that you are my Lord and my Savior in Jesus name Amen